when couples come into my office and I say, I want you to be aware of your nonverbals. I want you to be aware of the signal you're sending in that 90% of communication that's subconscious. You know, a lot of people will tell me, well, I don't have any control over that. You know, my tone of voice is what it is. My face does what it does. This is just me, you know, take it or leave it. And it's sort of a cop out. Mm -hmm. It's people who either don't believe they can take charge of themselves or, you know, they just don't want to do the work that, that it takes to retrain those automatic habits. Welcome to the Multi Amory Podcast. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. We believe in looking to the future of relationships, not maintaining the status quo of the past. So whether you're monogamous, polyamorous, swinging, casually dating, or if you just do relationships differently, we see you and we're here for you. On this episode of the Multi Amory Podcast, we're talking with therapist John Howard about his new book, More Than Words. John Howard is an internationally recognized therapist, wellness expert, and educator who uses the latest science to help couples have stronger relationships. He is the host of The John Howard Show, a wellness podcast, and the creator of the Ready, Set, Love series of online programs for couples. John is a Cuban-American whose first language is Spanish and thus prioritizes diversity and inclusion, drawing on multicultural influences from years of traveling and studying indigenous traditions. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent. Um, Just to start off, can you talk a little bit about yourself and how you got into your line of work? I know there's a lot of things just even besides you being a therapist and an author, you have a lot of things going on in your world. So let's talk about that a bit. Sure. Uh, So I was just broken as a kid. I did not live with my parents. I was neglected a lot. Uh, People didn't play with me. I went to school early. I was smaller than everybody. I didn't speak English. I had a lot of trouble making friends. I was a very anxious kid. I carried a stuffed animal to school. So I had a lot of issues and I did not grow up uh, around people or in a family that really understood emotional support or mental health support. And so I have this very distinct feeling that I remember as a kid of just feeling very, very alone. Uh, I was raised by my Cuban grandmother who died when I was nine and everybody around me thought it best to simply not talk about it. So the person who raised me essentially disappeared and I didn't know how to process that. I didn't have anybody to talk to. So by the time I woke up to what had happened to me, I was 15, 16. I left home. I I just kind of went looking for a better life. And I didn't really meet people who were into personal growth until I was 18 or so. So that began a healing process and is why I became a therapist, why I'm so interested in relationships and connection. Hmm. There's so many people out there that feel disconnected, alone and isolated and have no one to talk to about it. And so, you know, part of my work is to really reach people and also reach decision makers in society and see if we can shift priorities a little bit to say, hey, talking about relationships and connection and love and support really matters. And it's a really key part of mental health. That's excellent. Very cool. We do also want to get into your book, which just came out February 1st. It's called More Than Words, The Science of Deepening Love and Connection in Any Relationship. So right off the bat, like the very first thing that you say in this book is that connection is in and communication is out. So That's very different than what a lot of people out there say regarding just relationships in general and the way that people look at relationships and relationship uh, self-help books, things like that. So can you talk about the reasoning behind that? Yes. And I'm, you know, I'm stepping on a lot of toes, you know, by design. Um, What's fun and interesting about the new neuroscience of, you know, both mental health and relationships is just uh, it's breaking How, how many myths it's busting, how many ideas it's revising that have even been held in the field of psychology for a long time. So, you know, we thought communication was really the ticket to healthy relationships. But the reason why we believe that is because communication theory was all the rage in the 1970s in the field of psychology. And so it populated a lot of relationship self-help books that are still popular today. 
you know, it spread this information through academia into textbooks and into classes. And so it's taken a while to work our way out of that framework. But neuroscience is very clear. And, and we've had this science for the last 15 years or so that what the brain is mostly concerned with in relationships is a sense of safety and security. Uh, we want to feel relaxed. We want to know somebody has our back. We want to know that we're going to be emotionally supported and that someone cares about us much more than we care about thoughts and ideas and concepts and, and you know, the detail of, of the kind of stuff we talk about day to day. So this is why people get crossways in their relationships a lot is they're trying to rely on communication to bridge differences. And communication is a pretty inefficient tool. It's usually just, you know, more annoying um, when, when we're actually talking about our differences, you know, because then you introduce differences of perspective on those differences. And it's just, you know, layer after layer of stuff that doesn't quite fit. If you take the time to get connected first, nervous system to nervous system, you know, primitive brain to primitive brain, then all kinds of goodwill opens up. You know, we're willing to open our minds to understand stuff and to bridge across different ideas. So would you say that it's almost kind of looking at it of connection is necessary before we can even start thinking about communication? Yes. In our culture, we are taught to communicate to connect. And that's because we elevate logic and, and, and rationality in modern Western society. But the reality is the nervous system much prefers to connect in order to communicate. Um, a simple test of that is when you're hanging out with your best friend, it doesn't really matter if they screw up in the way they say things. You still buy the goodwill in that relationship and you're going to forgive them easily and move on. But when you're with someone you don't really trust, you know, they kind of give you the creeps. You're like, eh, I don't know. I don't feel totally secure with this person. It doesn't really matter how good their communication skills are. You're still going to be suspicious of what's going on. And that's because the nervous system is designed to track these very subtle signals that determine how safe we feel with someone. So can you lay out what that might look like then for someone who's maybe in a traditional relationship with their partner, you know, maybe thinking about tackling a difficult conversation or wanting to share something with their partner or wanting to, I guess, quote unquote, connect in the way that we think about on that kind of day to day basis in a relationship? You know, what would that approach entail? Like, what are the logistics of how we're actually connecting before communicating? What does that look like? So part of it is being in the moment and paying attention, because when we get verbal and heady, we lose track of what's happening in the moment and we lose track of nonverbal cues. It's a little bit like a meditation. If you're landing in the moment and you're paying attention to yourself and your partner's body language, eyes, face, tone of voice, nonverbal expressions, right? You're going to be able to take care of each other in the moment and not get so lost in the content. So when I say connect to communicate, what I mean is connect yourselves by taking care of the process, making sure you're relaxed, you feel good, you feel secure, you feel like you have each other's back, and then focus on the fancy content and ideas that you're trying to share. Uh, if you lose the connection, come back to it. Use physical proximity, use touch, use body language, uh, use your tone of voice and use eye contact to get it back. So, yeah, so I'm just kind of trying to, I'm trying to piece together just the image of this. Like if you were, let's say, coaching or working with a couple who's working through conflict or working through some kind of insecurity, you know, what are the things that you're coaching people to do? You know, it sounds like kind of, you know, yeah, making eye contact, making physical touch. What other things are you encouraging people to do before they open their mouths? You know, have, have a safety mindset. A lot of people aren't really tracking how secure the, the people in the interaction feel they're, they're too focused on their ideas and what they're trying to share. So if I have a couple in my office and they're getting crossways in their communication, very often what I have them do is stop talking for a bit, move in closer and touch, you know, maybe hold hands or hug each other, soften their face, soften their eyes and telegraph connecting signals through those nonverbal channels. Because what you're trying to do essentially is put the nervous system at ease before you go back to a dicey topic, if, if you keep trying to negotiate it with words and language, people typically just get elevated in their threat response. They get more frustrated, more annoyed, and then you lose the interaction altogether and you start arguing. So learning how to connect in simpler ways, nervous system to nervous system, and then go back to what you're talking about. Hmm. Right. right. Yeah, we have gotten questions regarding this specifically. 
like what this would look like, what you're talking about with a neurodivergent couple, for example, or where one or both partners are neurodivergent and where reading unspoken cues is perhaps not something that is accessible or it's not a strength. So what are your thoughts on on that specifically? Individuals and couples like that need to know how to connect because they may not be able to read subtle cues or emotional information on the face or in the tone. So very important that they not just rely on language and, and concepts, which can easily get people in trouble, but that they learn how to use physical proximity and touch. You know, very simple nonverbal cues that say, I love you, you're my person, I'm friendly, we're here together, we're here for each other. You know, for example, sitting close and holding hands doesn't take a lot of emotional EQ or, or reading ability, but it sends a very important signal to the nervous system. If you're having trouble reading cues and you sit at a distance of three feet and try to negotiate that interaction, you know, you're going to miss so much because now you're relying on concepts that have to fly through the air and the interpretation of those. So I think a lot of times these simple moves help not only neurodiverse individuals, but really all of us communicate very obviously, you know, I'm here for you, you're safe with me. And the nervous system really needs those obvious cues. You know, as you guys know, the brain tends to skew negative by default. Mm. So in the absence of obvious information that we're good, we're friendly, we're safe, the brain is going to keep assuming the negative, right? And looking for signs that it should be cautious. So I really love it when partners give each other these very clear, obvious signals. You know, they slow down, they don't multitask, they hold hands, they look in each other's eyes. I love you. I care about you. I'm here for you. Okay, now we can kind of sink into that moment and go into fancier stuff. Yeah. So I have a question arising about what you find are the most common obstacles for people being able to do this. Um, I think kind of piggybacking off of Emily bringing up the neurodivergence thing, I also think about trauma, especially very physically encoded trauma. I know for some of my clients, you know, encouraging them to touch each other and give those physical safety cues is very, very effective and really works to help bring down that charge and calm down the nervous system. And for other people, if they have a history of trauma, either with that particular partner or just with a previous partner, things like that, sometimes forcing the touch is very much more activating and much more destabilizing. So that's just kind of one scenario that I thought of. But I'm curious, in addition to that, like, are there common things that you see that gets in the way of people being able to do this and connect in this particular way? Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because there, there are people with a trauma history for whom eye contact and physical proximity and touch are going to be disconnecting rather than connecting. And so what you have to do in, in terms of applying this information is know your person. You can't just get super close and start staring at someone, you know, if they're sensitive in that way and that's going to cause a threat response within them. So, you know, this is why even those of us that have some relationship skills are never fully prepared for the unique relationship that we're in. Um, you have to learn your people. You have to adapt everything to who you're with. And if you know that someone is sensitive to touch, for example, a lot of people don't really like to be touched that much or they don't like to be touched unexpectedly. So mm -hmm. if you know that about your person, you have to adapt these techniques to create safety with that person. The bottom line is you're trying to increase a sense of safety and security in both people's nervous systems. So you don't want to make a move just because a book says eye contact is good or touch is good. You know, these are general pieces of advice that are going to work for a lot of people. But in a specific relationship, it might not be the right move. You know, for example, eye contact is not appropriate in a lot of cultures, um, not because of trauma, but simply because it's not a, a normal, you know, social move, even in a partner relationship. So just because we know eye contact can be connecting doesn't mean it's going to be in, in every culture or in every relationship. Now, I will say that for most people, what is disconnecting is the absence of these cues. It's the absence of touch. It's the absence of eye contact. It's the absence of physical proximity. It's the absence of being aware of your tone of voice, right? So it's important to study these markers because most of the time we're missing opportunities for connection by not leveraging those primitive cues that the nervous system needs. 
Having said that, if you have a partner with a trauma history, if, you, if you're sensitive in some ways, you do need to adapt these cues to make sure they are creating safety in your relationship. Yeah, it reminds me of the, the still face experiment, which is like videos that I send to my clients all the time that really, really drives that home. And I just, just wanted to highlight, I love that you said that about how even if you have relationship skills, you don't necessarily come in prepared for the relationship that you're in. That's a really, really interesting way of thinking about it. And so true. Yeah, I really think it's important for people to know that because so many people don't feel they're ready for a great relationship. So, you know, they're working on themselves. They're like, okay, I'm going to be ready soon. There's just a few things I'm working on. I'm in therapy. I'm kind of getting my career together. When I hear that, I always remind people, you're never going to be ready for the relationship you get into, you know, and relationships are a key part of your personal growth process. So don't wait too long you know, just start creating healthier relationships with your friends and family members. And, you know, let yourself be available for the people that show up because individually you're never going to be perfectly ready for anyone. And, And there's always an adaptation process you have to go through in any relationship. So something that we talk about a lot is metacommunication, you know, communicating about your communicating. And it kind of seems like that applies here too, with some of what you're talking about of coming back around to communicating, but communicating about that connecting of kind of what feels good to me, what feels safe, what what state am I in right now, especially if you and the other person are, are on the same page about we both want this connection. We're both aware this is important so that we can have better conversations. So we also need to communicate with each other about how to best do that. It's almost like a, a cycle between communication and connection that could get started there. Yeah. I mean, personally, I love metacommunication. But, but not everybody does. It's annoying to some people. So it, the term I would use instead is meta-awareness. You know, mm. we want to be aware of how, of how an interaction feels. Does it feel safe? Are we relaxed? Are we enjoying ourselves? And if not, why not? And not just meta-communication, because for some people, talking about how you're talking feels alienating, you know, from the topic that they're really wanting to get to, Right. Like if somebody wants to talk about how they're managing money or parenting issues or cleanliness and you stop them and say, well, first we need to talk about how we're talking before we can even get to that topic. A lot of people start to feel put off. They start to get annoyed. They get impatient. They're like, can we just talk about something? So personally, I love that because it creates an opportunity to, to create more safety in the interaction. But I also know that, you know, not everybody takes to it that way. And one way to get around that is to say, let's have an awareness of how we feel in this interaction. If any of us starts to feel stressed or overwhelmed, let's pause and do something different. Let's rub each other's shoulders. Let's massage, let's massage each other's hands. Let's take a walk. Let's make some tea. Let's do something that's connecting and then come back to it because you know, if the verbal communication is already a little bit activating, going into a meta communication about that can can be additionally activating. Uh, Sometimes people need the opposite, which is like to not talk or de-stress in a more physical kind of way. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, so still speaking about the nervous system here, in the second chapter of your book, you talk about how often Uh, the speed of a response to a partner is paramount to showing that your partner's understanding, accommodating of your needs. So can you first talk about that a little bit more? And then I have a follow-up question. Yeah, this is so interesting, you know, from from the neuroscience of, of relationships, because what couples generally argue about is things like, I'm clean and you're not, you know, I, I'm a strict parent and and you're too forgiving. I'm a spender and you're a saver. I like sex twice a day and you like it once a week. You know, like these are the things a lot of couples are arguing about. But the reality is that connection does not hinge on those things. Connection really hinges on deeper level cues that the nervous system is measuring to determine safety and security. So parenting differences is kind of like a higher order conceptual thing, right? We, we have to get into the realm of ideas, you know, to talk about that. The nervous system doesn't really care so much about that. In fact, when it feels safe and secure, people navigate these differences pretty easily. You take a spender and a saver. Well, if they don't feel connected, they're going to argue constantly. But when they do feel connected, they actually kind of trust that these differences can be managed and they have much more skill. Hmm. So what's interesting about speed of response 
is it's one of those things that actually affects the nervous system and therefore it affects connection. Um, speed of response is essentially the nervous system measuring how long it takes someone to pay attention to us. It, if I try to get your attention and it takes, you know, four to five seconds for you to look up from your email, well, my nervous system has been measuring that entire time in milliseconds, you know, how long that took because in a safety and security situation, that's too long. So I need to know that my people are there for me immediately if I need something, not four or five seconds later. And the whole time that you're, you know, spending finishing up what you're doing, writing that text, you know, finishing your social media post or whatever, and then you turn your attention to your partner, that's a faux pas in, in relationship that, that a lot of people don't realize is the nervous system wants to know that people are immediately responsive. That's, that's a security feature that's important to partnership. So the right move there is when your partner seeks your attention, stop what you're doing immediately and turn your attention to your partner, okay? Do this even if you're on the phone talking to someone. Say, hold on a second, my partner needs something. Hold on a second, my partner's asking me a question. Okay, what that does in your relationship is it elevates your partnership to the highest priority and it makes everybody feel good. Okay, now I know I can get your attention anytime I need it. I'm not wondering, you know, if I'm more important than Facebook or not. And there's a, there's a lot of people right now wondering, you know, about all the things that seem more important than them to the relationship. That really shouldn't be a question the nervous system has to ask. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I think, gosh, ages ago on the show, we talked about fubbing a little bit, the phone snubbing, uh, I guess, which is the the, the term for it. <laughs> but yeah, I think, and I think it's just that it's, it seems like it's not even going so far as I'm going to completely ignore my partner for the sake of scrolling on my phone. But it seems like there is something almost like that middle ground there where it is that I'm going to take just long enough to break away from my phone in order to pay attention to my partner that still carries this negative impact. It does. And unfortunately, you know, we, we get neither, we get neither side. We end up in this like, you know, dysfunctional gray zone. We're not really feeding the relationship or making a statement about how important our partner is. And we're not really giving full attention to what we're trying to finish either. It's really important to send that message of you come first, you know, person in my life that, that I'm sharing my life with and everything else comes second. Because when the nervous system believes that and feels that, it relaxes, you make the relationship much more secure. You know, you can always turn to your partner and say, yeah, what is it? Um, if it can wait, you know, I'd like to finish this email first. But your partner typically has a trump card to say, uh, it can't wait, I need you now. That's okay. Hmm. So my follow-up question then is thinking about all the, I guess I'll call them more quote unquote, modern day complications that get in the way with, of this, not just all of us being glued to our phones, but things like long distance relationships or how in much more increasingly we're having to rely on text to stay in touch with our partners throughout the day. And then, of course, also rope, roping in things like non-monogamous relationships where there's maybe multiple partners where it's not always clear who needs to be priority number one right in this particular moment, you know, that yeah. there were kind of juggling a sense of, I need both of my partners or all of my partners to know that they are a priority, you know, and I can't always necessarily default. So, so, I mean, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah. I mean, people who are poly open or bringing in a third might uh, elicit some threat responses, you know, from the attachment system. That's okay. That's not a reason to not pursue those relationship orientations, you just have to be aware that there might be a sense of threat posed by the presence of another person in those arrangements. So if we take devices, for example, you know, media is designed to draw us in and grab our attention. So we get addicted to social, we get addicted to our phones, we get addicted to TV, commercials, like everything is designed to really pull in our attention. We have to be very disciplined to guard against that. Otherwise, we're susceptible to it. We just get sucked in. So how do we be disciplined? Well, we have to keep reminding ourselves, my partner comes first, my relationships come first, my family comes first, my kids come first, my friends come first, you know, before all this other stuff that is trying to draw me in. So that same kind of discipline matters when you're in a poly relationship, open, or any type of non-monogamous relationship. You have to know what your relationship needs in order to feel secure. Now, this is different for every relationship. So generally speaking, there's three things I think are really necessary 
for poly and open relationships to succeed. But they're not, they're not true for every relationship. You know, in some relationships, people don't really care about having a primary. You know, they're just mm-hmm. happy and willing to share life with a number of people that are all of equal importance. And th- there's, they don't really feel a need to have a primary attachment figure. But if you're in a relationship where there is a primary and you're trying to develop secure attachment with that person, well, then you have to negotiate thirds and, and your poly orientation and your open lifestyle with a few features to make sure it doesn't compete. So what are those three things that you talk about? And you discuss this in your book, that there are three factors that allow non-monogamous relationships to function securely. Yes. Now, what's really interesting about this, and you guys probably know, uh, since you work in this area, is there's not a whole ton of uh, research on open and poly relationships yeah. compared <laughs> to, you know, committed monogamous relationships. So, yeah. you know, when I started working in this area, it was actually hard to find well-done research uh, that's been done on populations that are engaged in those lifestyles. So one of the things I did was I started calling my colleagues around the country, established and experienced couples therapists whose opinions I trust. And I started asking them, hey, are you seeing poly and open couples? And what are you seeing? What are you noticing? Now, what's interesting is there were two responses that I got back from from almost everyone. One was, you know, yes, I'm seeing them and they seem to have better communication and more self-awareness and more maturity than the monogamous couples I see. Hmm. Okay. So, so that's pretty cool. And that goes against what a lot of people think, you know, which is that, you know, open and, and poly couples are a mess and they're chaotic and not so according to most couples therapists, not, not most, but at least the people I spoke to. Uh, who are good at their craft, what they notice is a higher level of maturity, self-awareness, and communication skills in these relationships. But the other thing they said was also really interesting, which is I don't see a whole lot of them work out. Interesting. And in some cases I asked, can you put a percentage on that? You know, and usually the percentage was somewhere around 5% or so of poly and open couples they see end up at some point not working out. Are these people that tend to be monogamous first and then opening up their relationships or that started off as polyamorous and then are continuing that journey together? Or is it something else? Like, what is the configuration setup that you found? That I don't know, because it's it's not like this was an organized research study or anything. (laughs) But it made me curious about, well, what are the factors that help poly and open couples be successful over time? Because I kept hearing these really low success rates. And, you know, one of the things we do know is that if there is a low success rate, it's in part because there's low social support for these types of relationships. Mm -hmm. So when people don't feel like they can talk about their poly and open relationship, when they feel stigmatized by their friends and neighbors, when they're not seeking support from family members or they're not going into therapy because they're not sure the therapist is going to be friendly to their arrangement. Well, that lack of, of structural support is one of the reasons why it's harder to pull off those types of relationships. You know, we used to see that a lot and still do with same-sex couples where they don't necessarily access the same level of support uh, that a hetero couple might. And it's an issue. It contributes to poor outcomes in some cases. So the three things that I think really matter to help poly and open couples be successful when they're trying to have a secure relationship, you know, whatever it is that means to them, is number one, usually these couples need to have above average self-awareness. Ideally, all the people in the relationship would have above average self-awareness. Why? Because you have to know where your boundaries are. You have to know what's okay and what's not okay. You have to know what you're feeling about something and you have to be able to express those emotions. So how do you possibly do that if you're not tuned into yourself, if you don't know what really affects you, if you don't know what's okay and what's not okay? So in order to set the boundaries appropriately, you have to know yourself pretty well. You have to have a high level of of individual maturity to say, well, these things really matter to me. These things don't. You know, these things affect me. These things make me sad. These things make me feel scared. These things threaten me and these other things don't. A lot of people don't have that level of self-awareness and maturity. And so I think that's one reason why sometimes poly and open relationships don't make it long term is because you're really asking for people to be, you know, more mature to navigate that type of arrangement. Hmm. 
Second, I think people need above average communication skills. In other words, they have to be talking actively about their lifestyle, about what feels good, what doesn't. Um, they can't put this on autopilot. You know, they have to be able to communicate um, how they're going to approach this arrangement. And they have to be able to do that with, with a level of skill and maturity that's uncommon, honestly. I think you see it more in same-sex couples as a therapist, you know, gay and lesbian couples and queer couples tend to have better open communication. For example, when they're attracted to someone, you know, it's not such a taboo topic to say, ooh, I'm attracted to that person. I wonder what we should do about that. That that's often a taboo topic in in hetero couples. So it's like that. If you're gonna, you know, bring in a third or be poly or open, you have to be willing to openly communicate your desires, your attractions, your preferences, your kinks, you know, your turn-ons. And that's not that common of a skill set. You know, that's something that people really have to work toward and practice. And the third thing is people have to monitor. Because what happens is, even if you think this lifestyle is for you based on your preferences, when you implement it is, is when you're really going to find out how it feels. It's very hard to predict the emotional reality of operating as a poly or, or an open couple until you're living that life and feeling the emotions that come from that. So what I mean by monitoring is you can't just decide to be open and then, and then that's it. And then everybody goes off and, and does what they want. You have to actually monitor how it's feeling. Do we need to shift these boundaries? Do we need to tweak them? Do we need to change them? Like, oh, you went on a date last night and I thought that was going to feel okay. But when you were out, I realized like how hard that was for me and how threatened I feel and how scared I felt. So we need to slow down. We need to talk. We need to prepare more. We need to talk about what kinds of dates you're going on with who. I'm I'm going to need more emotional preparation for those types of events. So monitoring allows you to tweak as you go, which is really a key part of making sure these lifestyles are not threatening to the security you're trying to establish. Yeah, I think that echoes something we talk about a lot on the show, which is about being experimental. But, you know, the fact that um, sunset clauses on increments are your friend, you know, and of course, always encouraging that that checking back in and checking back in regularly, you know, even for people who have been non-monogamous for 20 years, it's still good to to have that check in process to see how things are shifting and changing for sure. So we're going to go on to talk about some other things, some about non-monogamy, as well as talking about boundaries, rules, agreements, and getting more into some of this research. But first, we're going to take a quick break to talk about some of the ways you can support this show and keep this content coming to all of you out there for free. Lube is the key to maximizing pleasure, whether alone or with a partner. And if you're going to lubricate, you want to make sure it's done with the highest quality body safe ingredients. You know it. You love it. Just like us, nothing beats Uber Lube. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all, all joking aside, we do love it a lot. And if you don't know that you love it, you just haven't gotten to that point in your life yet where you know that you love it. But you're going to get there. <laughs> so we definitely recommend it. It's fantastic. It's a high-grade silicone lubricant made from body-friendly ingredients. It's just silicone and a little vitamin E. It feels great on your skin. It doesn't get sticky or whatever. If you Even if you leave it on, it just absorbs into your skin. It's fantastic. And unlike water-based lubes, doesn't get into your bloodstream. So people who have reactions to water-based lubes often don't with silicone-based lubes because of that. And one of my favorite things is it doesn't have any smell or taste. So if you like doing things with your mouth while you got lube going on, it's a pleasurable experience and you get to focus on the person that you're having fun with instead of just the smell of lube. <laughs> right now, they're offering Multiamory listeners a special offer of 10% off and free shipping when you use our code MULTI at uberlube.com. That's 10% off and free shipping. Just use code MULTI at U-B-E-R-L-U-B-E dot com. All right, folks, if you're feeling ready to get back out there to put yourself out into the dating world, one of the easiest ways to do so is on a dating app. However... Many of the apps out there are geared toward traditional monogamous relationships. If you want to find a different kind of dating app, our sponsor for this week, Field, can help you out. 
Field is an excellent opportunity for you to get back out there. It is an alternative dating app for couples and singles. It's inclusive to all, no matter your gender or orientation. When you join, you can actually choose from more than 20 sexual and gender identity options. And since the pandemic, Field members have expressed a radically increased desire to connect on an emotional and cultural level rather than just purely a sexual one. So with radical open-mindedness designed into the app, you can share freely about your sexuality, no matter how traditional or kinky you might be. Nonconformity and shame-free individuality is what Field is all about. And here's some great news. You can download the Field app for free, and you can support our show by doing so. Just go to multiamory.com slash field. That's multiamory.com slash F-E-E-L-D. Or just click the link in our episode description to get the Field app for free today. Now, if you're someone who is dating multiple people or having sex with multiple people, taking care of your sexual health and knowing the status of your sexual health is really important. Being aware of your STI status, for instance, it protects not only you, but also your partners. And now with the help of our sponsor, Everly Well, you can do that from the comfort of your very own home. Yeah, Everly Well at-home lab tests give you physician-reviewed results and personalized insights so that you can take action on your health and wellness at affordable costs and transparent upfront cost, right? It's not like going to the doctor and you never know how much it's going to be at the end. I mean, you should still go to your doctor, but these tests are a great supplement to that and give you things to talk about when you go in to talk to your doctor. They have over 30 different tests, things like metabolism, stress, thyroid, but their STD tests are just so handy. They have one pack that tests for seven different STIs, all from the privacy of your home. It's really easy to do. The way it works is they just ship you your test kit. You collect the samples, whether that's blood or saliva or urine. You mail it back in, and within about a week or so, They have a physician review those results and they send you those results that you can get online. It's super convenient. I did the metabolism and stress one not too long ago, and I'm actually due for one of my STI tests. So I'm looking forward to taking that and making it so easy to do it. If you want to try it out for yourself, for listeners of the show, Everly Well is offering a special discount of 20% off an at-home lab test at everlywell.com slash multi. That's everlywell.com slash multi for 20% off your at-home lab test. E-V-E-R-L-Y-W-E-L-L dot com slash multi. And when it comes to having fun in the bedroom, one of my favorite things to do is to fall asleep on my delightful Helix <laughs> mattress. <laughs> I've had this now for, for over a year and I, I love it. It's fantastic. I, I just I always feels good to get into bed. I really enjoy it. And on their site, they have a sleep quiz that takes just two minutes to complete and it matches your body type, your sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. So rather than just having to arbitrarily pick, well, I guess this one seems good. With Helix, you're going to get a mattress you know is going to be right for the way that you sleep. Yeah, so I took the Helix quiz. I was matched with the Dusk model of mattress because I wanted something that was kind of medium firmness and because I tend to roll around between sleeping on my side and sleeping on my back. The first thing that I noticed actually once we got the mattress was I was able to sleep on my back throughout the whole night, which is really, really rare for me. And that was super helpful because my chiropractor was really recommending sleeping on my back. (laughs) That was the very, the first thing. And since then, in the year since getting the mattress, it's stayed pretty supportive. You know, it hasn't noticed any sagging or any weird lumpy spots that you get, especially sometimes when you're sharing a mattress with a partner. It's really been fantastic. Um, I'm finding myself waking up with my spine feeling pretty good in the morning. So if you're looking for a mattress, you take the quiz, you order the mattress that you're matched to, and then the mattress comes right to your door shipped for free. So you don't even need to set foot into a mattress store ever again. Just go to helixsleep.com slash multi, take their two-minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. They have a 10-year warranty, and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up if you don't love it, but you will. 
Helix even has financing options and flexible payment plans, so a great night's sleep is never far away. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash multi. That's helixsleep.com slash multi. All right, and we're back and we're continuing our conversation with John Howard. So... We talk a lot on the show about boundaries and rules and agreements. As you mentioned, all of those things are definitely in any relationship really important to establish, but definitely in non-monogamous relationships as well. So can you discuss your specific take on those things and what you talk about in the book? Sure. I mean, in any non-monogamous arrangement, it's really important to know yourself and, and to know what feels okay, what doesn't when it comes to rules and boundaries and so on. I think the point that I would stress is is how important it is to do that collaboratively, you know, not just at the individual level. Because in any relationship, regardless of, you know, the type of relationship it is, what's really hard for people is merging life and perspective uh, with another person. This is why security often gets threatened in relationships. It's not necessarily because of the relationship orientation, you know, meaning are we monogamous or are we open or are we poly? That's not necessarily what's going to threaten the relationship. What what tends to threaten relationships more than that is just the awkwardness we all have in functioning collectively and understanding that there needs to be a team conversation above the I conversation. So even if I know what feels good to me and what doesn't, uh, we have to prioritize the collaborative process of what's good for the relationship and what's good for the team. And that's a little bit of a different conversation from, you know, what do I want? What's fun for me? You know, like, obviously we need to know that stuff too and prioritize it if it matters. But I see a lot of people doing that to the detriment of what does the relationship need in order to feel stable, secure, and to succeed? That's a little bit more of a selfless question, right? Mm -hmm. That's asking, what does this team need to succeed, even if I need to sacrifice a little bit to contribute to that, I'm going to get more back from this secure relationship than if I keep cycling through people. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I, I would wonder about, you know, and I think that that is good practice for sure. I would wonder about, I mean, something we talk about on the show a lot is also, you know, there's not necessarily one way that people practice polyamory. In particular, in the community right now, there's been for several years a big emphasis on people practicing non-hierarchical polyamory, you know, where I have two partners, but I'm not necessarily picking out one relationship. It's like, that's the relationship. That's the team. Maybe people don't necessarily want to practice in that way. And so I guess I'm wondering that when it comes to that, (laughs) to be honest, I think we've done 6 billion episodes trying to address this because this shows up in all kinds of different manifestations for people. But your thoughts on that, you know, where it's not always clear okay, I know that my guiding light is I want to preserve this relationship. And so I make choices just for this relationship. You know, what's your advice for people where it's maybe I want to preserve both of these relationships? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, you know, as therapists, our our rule of thumb is always, is it working for people or is it not working for people? If it's working for someone, then why change it? It's great. Um, You know, all we need to do is celebrate it. Like, you know, if someone wants to keep cycling through partners and that's their jam, cool. You know, I mean, who cares? Um, That's great. The issue occurs when people are not happy with with what's happening in their relationship life. They don't feel like they have the support or the security or the safety they want, but they do want to pursue a poly or or an open lifestyle. So if you're in a non-hierarchical arrangement, you know, that's great. If it's working for you, great. If it has issues because people feel insecure or they feel threatened or there's a lack of communication and so on, then what I would define as the team in that context is everybody in that relationship. Uh, You don't have to identify a dyad and and say, okay, this dyad is the team and this other person is, is the third on the outside. And by the way, there's a lot of talk about this in the attachment space because when people started talking about attachment theory, it was all dyad, dyad, dyad. Mm -hmm. And that's because the research started with, you know, caregiver infant pairs and really studying that dyadic relationship. So when attachment theory was extended to adults, it was only natural to examine dyadic relationships and say, okay, what is the attachment system in this dyad? I I think that's 
a misunderstanding of, of the attachment literature. And it creates a misinterpretation problem, which is people who are naturally open and poly, you know, suddenly feel stigmatized because they're not in a secure dyad. I don't think the dyadic nature of the team really matters. I think being part of a team matters, right? Like who has your back? If that's a tribe of people, then then cool, but you should feel secure within that tribe. You should have go-to people that support you, that love you, you know, that will give you uh, the goodies when when you need help. So let's say, you know, you're in a non-hierarchical uh, poly relationship uh, and it's three people in the relationship and there's really no dyadic uh, primary. Well, the team conversation is going to be, you know, what do we need to feel secure with each other? Let's not just be individualistic about it. Let's really think as a team, you know, what's good for this non-hierarchical arrangement. And what that does is it forces collective thinking. Um, this is really important in relationships because if you get too self-centered, you can't broker a shared space. You know, what, what a therapist might call a two-person psychological system you know, what we really mean is, do you have a collectivist psychological system? Are you able to prioritize other people besides yourself at the same time that you're trying to prioritize yourself? And I think you can do that in a relationship of three or four or five, as well as you can in a dyad. Hmm. I think it's hard for Americans to get on board with uh, collectivist care and thinking, but that's mm. a topic for another time. Yes, <laughs> quite. That's for m- multi-socialistery or other yeah. podcasts. <laughs> now, um, I, I do think that's interesting, but I would want to take that and kind of, I think the same things that you said, I would just want to apply it more toward not specifically multi-person relationships. So that's not really what we're seeing a ton of. I mean, that absolutely happens, but more multiple interlocking dads, dads, yeah, mm-hmm. right? But I do think there is this interesting thing that I've noticed between ones that can be very stressful and contentious where there's more of that sense of maybe I have my team with this one other person, but then everyone outside of this is a threat. And so that's, you know, that's the feeling that I'm going to have about that. And that's how I'm going to react to it versus the sense of, well, I'm not in a relationship with that other person, but... I do think of them as kind of being part of my team Mm because we're both on team loving this other person, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. (laughs) We're both on that team, even if we're not doing it together per se. And I think that distinction right there, at least in my experience, has really made that difference between people who are having a better time with polyamory (laughs) than people who are having a less good time. (laughs) Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. And I love the complexity of that because you see that in other cultures, you know, where, where those types of relationship arrangements are more easily brokered and people don't have the same threat reactions Mm -hmm. to them. A lot of this is cultural conditioning. You know, what are you taught to perceive as threatening? And that's how your nervous system will react based on, you know, how you evaluate it. But if you grow up in a culture where it's normal, you know, to, to share people and, you know, parent with other people and share families and things like that, well, then it becomes normalized and you don't have the same threat response. So I, I still think the key question is, do people feel secure? And if they do, then they're doing the right things. And if they don't, then they really need to ask themselves, okay, what's going on here? And if we just try to broker those things through communication, often it's just not quite enough to get all the way into the nervous system and speak that language of security. In your book, you also talk about something called a culture of practice around developing relationship skills. So I I really like that term. Can you talk about what that practice looks like to you? Yeah, this is really fun. So I have a lot of friends that are improv actors. And when when couples come into my office and I say, I want you to be aware of your nonverbals. I want you to be aware of of the signal you're sending in that 90% of communication that's subconscious. You know, a lot of people will tell me, well, I don't have any control over that. You know, my tone of voice is what it is. My face does what it does. This is just me, you know, take it or leave it. And it's sort of a cop out. Mm -hmm. It's people who either don't believe they can take charge of themselves or, you know, they just don't want to do the work that that it takes to retrain those automatic habits. But I will often point to people I know who have a lot of acting training and and they do this for a living to say, look, you know, you can definitely be more aware of your nonverbals and you can definitely take control of the signal you're sending somebody else, whether they perceive you as friendly or non-friendly. 
you know, an acting class would teach you that, you know, how do you take control over your face? How do you take control over your tone of voice and your eyes and your body expression? It's too easy to say, ah, it's automatic. I can't do anything about it. I'm sorry. You know, yeah. and then we, we walk around sending threat signals to people and creating insecure relationships. So a culture of practice really means that we're going to take ownership of our ability to control the sense of security. We're not going to leave it up to chance. And we're certainly not going to leave it up to our childhood conditioning, you know, because I'm example A of that not being a good idea. Hmm. But the point is that we can take ownership of it and say, okay, maybe we have some bad habits. Maybe I have some bad habits, but we can actually practice together and learn how to send secure signals to each other. We may not be very good at it right now, but if we practice just like anything else, we'll get better at it. And shockingly, this is really missing from relationship culture. Even though relationships are like many other domains, you know, music, sports, language, where a lot of what happens is based on really fast procedural memory. Okay, most interactions between people happen really fast. And, and, and all the stuff we do is pre-thought. But that doesn't mean we can't retrain ourselves, right? That would be like an athlete saying, you know, sorry, my motor memory happens really fast. Sorry, I don't, I don't really have any control over shaping it. Well, it's true it happens really fast, but you can retrain it. And this is what I mean by a culture of practice. It's like, let's take the stuff we suck at and let's practice it proactively until it looks better and sounds better. When we've done that, now it's built into our motor memory and we can't use that same excuse, you know, for years and years and years of like, oh, you know, we're just bad at this or it's a core issue or whatever. You can do something about it. So we're rewriting those neural pathways, essentially. Yeah, exactly. That only happens through practice. Mm -hmm. You can't talk your way into developing new neural pathways or, you know, dusting them off and, and optimizing them because talk just doesn't do it. Talk is an idea. You have to get your body involved. You have to get, you know, your, your motor memory involved. All these default habits that are wired into the brain. The only way you can retrain those is by doing things experientially. I was going to say, I really appreciate, at least to me, I get a real impression of kind of gentleness around just that phrase, culture of practice, as opposed to, I guess, culture of perfection or something like that. <laughs> because I think what we've seen in the relationship and communication and psychology sphere, at least on I guess the maybe the pop psychology consumer side that, for instance, something like attachment theory becomes popular and people start to learn about it and start to figure out what their attachment style is. And that's great. But then it also what we've seen is then leads people to be like, well, I'm anxious attached and that's just the way I am. And so that's how I'm going to react to everything. I have anxious attachment style. That's how it's going to be, you know. And so if I react in this particular way that causes stress in the relationship, like that's that's not my problem. Hmm. And it is kind of like trying to find this middle ground of where you don't want to tell someone, hey, your personality, your hangups, your trauma, the way your brain works, you don't want to tell somebody, oh, just throw that in the garbage and just be different. But we also, I think, like you said, don't want to just use that excuse of, oh, that's just the way I am. I can't control any of these things. And so if that's aversive to my partner or really getting in the way of my relationships, then they need to just go jump in a lake or something like that. At least right. that's how I'm interpreting the message. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, I think what we forget sometimes is relationship is how we get better. So mm -hmm. you know, how are we possibly going to get better at these relationship skills unless we're practicing them in a relationship? You know, I have a lot of people that tell me, well, I'm working on myself. I'm getting ready for a relationship. I'm working on it's like, yeah, but if you work on that stuff by yourself or in a vacuum or with a therapist, good luck to you when you're back in a real relationship again, because that stuff is going to come back out. So the better approach is to simply be improving our, our existing relationships, whether they're friendships or they're coworker relationships or family bonds, or you do have a partner or kids or whatever. It's like, take the relationships that exist in your life and work to improve them intentionally through practice. Because what you'll find is that it builds your secure skills so that naturally you're sending more connecting signals. And, and that's really what we need in any relationship is the ability to automatically, non-verbally put people at ease um, without having to slow down and think about it constantly. So uh, as a last note here, you know, your book is called More Than Words, and you put this heavy emphasis on connection, on these nonverbal cues, on calming nervous systems. But you do also talk about 
some words in relationship. <laughs> you know, you do talk about how there it is still important to build that skill of, for instance, expressing your emotions as words. Um, you also make references to particular words that threaten connection. So I guess I just want to hear from you about that. Like once we have connected and we are getting to the actual verbal communication piece of it, what you found and what your recommendations are. Yeah. Thank, I mean, we have language for a reason. I just really wanted to make the point, you know, and make sure it didn't get lost, that most of what the nervous system is paying attention to is nonverbal cues and signals. And so when you get those right, you can layer verbal communication on that connection, and it's going to go much more smoothly than if you don't connect first. But uh, assuming that message gets through and people go, okay, maybe I should talk less and be aware of my eye contact. Maybe I should talk less and make sure my face is expressing friendliness and my tone of voice is communicating warmth. You know, that's really the message I want people to get. But once people get there, then obviously language does matter. And we can say things that enhance connection or we can say things that detract from connection. Now, I list some mistakes that people make in their communication in the book because we're all very different. You know, for example, some people say too little. And, you know, finding out how they feel is like pulling teeth. That can impact connection because you're always guessing. Some people talk too much. You know, they talk your ear off with stuff you don't need to know. And after a while, you feel overwhelmed and annoyed. And it's like, okay, that's not very attuned either. So there's not really a standard for everyone. And every relationship is unique. But one thing that I think we do know about words is that if you're intentional with your words and you don't clutter them, you can connect more deeply with words. So if I approach you and, and you're my partner and I look you in the eye and I say, I love you so much. You are so wonderful. I'm so lucky to have you in my life. I just want to tell you what you mean to me. And I let that stand and I don't clutter it with stuff. Okay. That's a pretty connecting message. It's, it's obvious. It's simple. It's concise. And it goes in. But a lot of times what happens is we're sort of embarrassed and ashamed and awkward about communicating so directly. And so we'll sort of say, I love you and I care about you, but we'll mix it in with a bunch of other stuff. Okay. <laughs> and, and then it, it, it's not as impactful. You know what I mean? Because people will focus on all this other stuff we threw in there. So the point is a lot of people think we need more time to connect, but the truth is when people have time, they still don't connect. Because connection is awkward, you know, it's like, it's, it's embarrassing, um, it's vulnerable. And so the real question is, are we emotionally courageous enough to connect? And if we are, it only takes a very small amount of time. I mean, how much time does it take for me to completely slow down, put my phone down, hold your hands and tell you how much you mean to me and how much I love you and care about you? You know, that might take me 30 seconds. So the time excuse is bullshit. Um, the real question is our courage. And that's where I think a lot of us miss the boat, myself included. It's like you have to get over that embarrassment and awkwardness to really say what you feel in your heart hmm. and not clutter it with, oh, by the way, would you pick that up from the grocery store on your way home? You know, thank you so much. Love you. It's like, okay, yeah, that's nice. But um, there's got to be times when connection is the main event. Wow. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, John, and talking about all of this. Can you tell our listeners where can they find more about you, the various things you do, and of course, uh, where they can order your book? Sure. So first of all, I just want to say I really appreciate all of you and thank you so much for having me on. Of course. You know, non-monogamy is not my area of expertise, but I've always wanted to support poly open and non-monogamous relationships because they get a lot of shit from the culture and it's completely unfair. I mean, there's probably more acceptance of same-sex couples now than there is of non-monogamous couples, you know? And so this type of discrimination that everybody experiences when they're just trying to live their life and, and, and share love and, and have healthy relationships is ridiculous. And it's really important that those of us that are relationship experts and are in a position to say something about it, you know, say, look, all of these relationship types can be healthy and secure and productive, and you can raise kids in them and you can have healthy families. And, 
because, you know, the, the stigma and the judgment and all of that is really high for a lot of people. And, and it makes me sad to think about that. So I just appreciate you guys for having the show and making this a featured topic. People can get the book really anywhere, but if they go to getmorethanwords.com, they'll get some extra free bonus goodies from me. Hmm. Like I wrote a whole chapter on attachment, which I think is really useful because when I was trying to heal, attachment theory was a big part of my recovery. So the chapter didn't make it into the book because we had so much other cool stuff to put in the book. But if people go to getmorethanwords.com, you can still get the book on Amazon or whatever you want. But you end up on my email list and I can send you that bonus chapter on attachment. I have some other goodies there, like a myth busting guide and a connection guide so you can start learning right away. So that'd be one place people can go. Excellent. Awesome. We are going to continue our conversation with John in our bonus episode. So this is going to talk about questions to ask to evaluate the markers of secure functioning in your relationships. Really excited to talk to you about that. Our question of the week is, what is more important to you in a relationship, communication or connection? So I'm very interested to hear that because I think John had a lot of good points about connection this week, but communication is also important. So let's talk about that a bit. The best place to share your thoughts with other listeners is on this episode's discussion thread in our private Facebook group or Discord chat. You can get access to these groups and join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can share with us publicly on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Multiamory is created and produced by Jace Lindgren, Dedeker Winston, and me, Emily Matlack. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio Balvanera. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our researcher for this episode was M. Mays. Our production assistants are Rachel Shenowark and Carson Collins. Our theme song is Forms, I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. 